Well, let's go right back to Genesis chapter 3. In the volume of the book, it is written of him. He said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you'll find eternal life, but it is they that testify of me. He says, I speak on behalf of the king. I tell you, he is here. He is here in these pages. We ended the second chapter at the 24th verse. And therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. One. Shall be one. They're different from each other. They are supposed to be. Pastor Chuck Smith would, um, he would say it this way. He, he would say, you're looking at, at, at men, you need to know that they aren't all there. There's a lot that has been taken. I agree with this sentiment. That a man is incomplete. Well, I, let me put it this way. A man may be complete, but the image of God that he bears is just a little bit diminished since the subtraction of everything that the woman reveals about God. In, in the West, in America, for the last few uh, decades, the silliness of the philosophical suggestion is that men need to get in touch with their feminine side which I submit to you was removed in Genesis chapter 2 by God himself. And a man does not have a feminine side until he takes a wife. I do maintain that men and women are different, and the differences between us, I cited just two differences, that men are physically stronger. But women are emotionally deeper. Now, it is the good design of God. It's God's design, and it is good. God wired the man to be the head of the house, the head of the home. But God has wired the woman to be the heart of the home. And they need to work together, completing one another. But the heart must be in submission to the head. The head must be influenced by the heart. Men and women are different, and they have different needs, and the, their needs are also good. They're God's doing. God created men with a longing for respect. That they would be the kind of man that people would actually respect. And that's a, it's a good thing, it's not a bad thing. I'm not talking about the vanity of sinful humanity. I'm talking about in Genesis chapter 2, before Genesis chapter 3 takes place, there is in the heart of every man what God put in Adam and that is the desire for greatness, that he might actually glorify God. He might actually glorify his maker, be truly respectable. Every single woman has a need that God put there deep in her heart, and it's different. And that need is to know that she is loved. She was made for love. She has a need in her heart to know that she is loved, that one loves her and would risk everything for her. Now, God put that there. That's a good thing. God put it there. It's his doing. He made us male and female. He made us very similar, but he also made us very different from one another. And then what do we read? Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, the final verse of the second chapter. 
It says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. There was no shame associated with being naked. Then, shame will come in just a few verses. Why was there shame after they did that which God forbid them to do? Why was there shame? Understand it this way. In the simplicity of God's revealed will to them, they had, remember, two commands. They had, as it were, two tables of the law, even as we have the Ten Commandments on two tablets, two tables of the law. First table of the law deals with our vertical obligation to love and to honor God. Second table of the law deals with our horizontal obligation to love our neighbor as ourselves, our fellow man. It is therefore only appropriate that the cross, the intersection of the horizontal and the vertical, the vertical and the horizontal, would be the very implement of the sacrifice of Christ on behalf of all the lawbreakers. They had two tables. They were simpler. <clears throat> they were shorter. They had one command that they were to do. They had another command that they were to not do. One prohibition and one blessing. What was that blessing? What was that command? Well, we talked about it last night. They were commanded to love one another and to make life. They were commanded to make life happen. Commanded to love one another and let life come from that love. Commanded to make life. The other command was, don't make death happen. That one tree is forbidden. That one tree is not for you on the day that you eat of it. You will surely die. Dying, you will die. You'll be separated. You'll be alienated. You'll become mortal. And you'll die. So two commands. Make life. Don't make death. Understand then, the very parts of their body given to them by their creator to obey that blessing, that beautiful command to love and make life. The very parts of their body given to fulfill that command will become the center of their shame when they have broken the other command and they make death happen and they make death happen to all of us. Death passed to all men by one man, by Adam. Simply stated, make life happen, don't make death happen. They made death happen. They introduced death. They introduced it to all of us who would be reproductions of them. And the center of their shame would be the parts of their bodies given to them to obey the command to make life. Now let's go into chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden, the opening lines of chapter 3 are, And the serpent said to the woman, No explanation given to us right there as to the origin or the identity of the serpent. God does not do things that way. Instead, God scatters all through divine revelation a little piece here, from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 14, a little piece from Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 28, another, another little piece here, John chapter 8, 
And then ultimately, it's always the other end of divine revelation and revelation chapter 12. That we have official confirmation that that serpent in Eden was Satan. From the prophet Isaiah, we discover that that serpent, Satan, had been an angel. Perhaps the glorious, greatest angel. And that particular angel became the father of lies. A liar from the beginning and a murderer. He became the father of lies. What's that mean, father of lies? That means he's the first liar. He's the original liar. Who did he lie to first? Oh, before he lied to the angels who followed his rebellion. Before he lied to our mother Eve, he had lied to himself. He'd convinced himself of his own invented lie. He is the father of evolution. Long before Charlie Darwin, the lie of evolution was uttered in the heart of Lucifer. In those words, I will ascend. Five I wills from Isaiah 14. I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. Far from being like the Most High and far from ascending, he was cast out of heaven and cast down to the earth. He shows up here to sell the same lie. The same lie that he sold himself, he now seeks to sell to our mother Eve. But he starts with a question. He starts with the suggestion in the question. Yea, hath God said, now listen to me, the serpent continues to say, Yea, hath God said, the serpent continues into our present age, suggesting that you cannot actually know what God has said. But we can, he's a liar, he's a liar, and we can know. What God has said. Yea, hath God said. You can't have everything. Do I understand correctly? You cannot have everything. Now before we go further into his manipulation of her mind, I want you right now to stop and think about why the serpent is saying this to the woman. Why is the serpent making the suggestion with his question to the woman? Why? Why does he strike there? What business does he have with Adam's wife, Eve? Well, I'll tell you this. I believe that predator studied carefully and observed God's Good design, and God's good design has her so much more emotional, a greater capacity for emotion, for deep feelings, both good and bad. I actually believe the serpent observed the distinctions between the man and the woman. And while I also maintain that the man, Adam, was his ultimate target, he struck where he knew he could be effective in order to get to the man. So he begins to manipulate how she feels, suggesting to her that they're not truly free if they can't do whatever they want. He's asking the question, do I understand that God won't let you do whatever you want? Do I understand correctly that you cannot have everything you want? The woman's response, of course, was, the woman said unto the servant, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. 
And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. And with those words, the serpent introduces their concept. That there's such a thing as freedom where you can do whatever you want and there's no consequence. The serpent suggests that it is not a cause and effect universe that God has created. The serpent introduces her to an idea that you can do whatever you want to do and it won't matter. That's a lie, isn't it? Isn't it? It is a lie. There are consequences to every choice that we make. We have to weigh out those choices. God had spoken to Adam, telling him, now you're free to do this, but don't do it, because the day that you do, you will surely die. Now our mother Eve has added to the message from God. He didn't say don't touch it. He said don't eat of it. She, relating back to the serpent, sort of defending God, she says God has said don't eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. No. She's already in trouble. Can I just suggest to you, the woman would do well to not dialogue with a serpent. And I say to all of you, my dear sisters, my dear daughters, every one of you, daughters of Eve, recognize that the serpent is still talking to women. And he will use a mouthpiece of a man. And don't allow yourself to be manipulated. <laughs> Recognize. Recognize your own vulnerability, dear sister, dear daughter. Recognize you have been made deeply emotional. And it's good, but it can be used against you, and it was here. And dear brothers, when you observe a woman is making the mistake of dialoguing again with a serpent, step in and make sure that she knows that's a serpent. As a brother, as a father, step in there. Step right in rudely between them. I have done it at church. I did it just two weeks ago. Matter of fact, two weeks ago. I made the observation that a sweet Christian lady in our church was just trying to be Christian, just trying to be nice, smiling and hospitable to a snake. <laughs> now you might say this very judgmental of you, and you'd be wrong. The same Lord Jesus in the same serpent that he said, judge not lest you be judged, in the same sermon where he warned of harsh judgment, he also said, don't give what is sacred to the dogs. Didn't he? That requires you to be able to identify a dog. He said, don't cast your pearls to the pigs. This requires identifying a pig dog. That's not judging. In the same sermon where he said, Watch out for wolves in sheep's clothing. There are predators, and especially in church. Ladies, I'm going to tell you something. Sisters, daughters, listen to me. A lot of those predators that creep into church, wolves in sheep's clothing, will at some point or another let you know they are praying about you. They spell it P-R-E-Y-I-N-G. <laughs> They're predators, and you are the prey. So be on your guard and recognize. You're going to look for the zipper on that sheep costume. Be on your guard. And I, and I did. I, I observed there's a guy just making his move, and he's actually talking. I hear what he's doing, and he's talking about how far back we go. 
Failing to mention, of course, that we met as I was doing jail ministry, and he was incarcerated as a lawbreaker. He was, he was leaving that out. I noted that. But I'd already told him, I think you're only here at this church for the women, and it won't be tolerated. So when I saw him, and she, I could tell, she doesn't want to be rude. She's, she's, you know, she's being Christian. She's being sweet and being nice. And I stepped right in between the two of them, interrupting him, backing up, pushing him back. And I told her, stop being nice to this man. Move on. <laughs> now, maybe you can't get away with that kind of aggression. But you ought to at least care enough that you would step in. If you can't step in, send your wife. But by all means, when you see the serpent and the woman in a dialogue interrupt it one way or the other. The serpent is manipulating her. The serpent is going to manipulate how she feels, and he introduces both the concept that you can be completely free to do whatever you want, and there's no consequence, and he's telling the same lie he sold himself, and that is evolution. His very next words. The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know. Then in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. As if, somehow or another, knowing good was not enough. That you're messing out on the evil. <laughs> now, what he says is true. You will know good and evil, but you will not be as gods. He suggested to her that she would evolve that she would be more enlightened, that partaking of what was forbidden was going to benefit her. Mm, it's a lie. I tell you, at the foundation, at the very core of every false religion is evolution as a concept. The original lie in the universe. Now I want you to look at verse 6. Verse 6 is a heavy verse. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, Brothers and sisters, fellow ministers, listen to me. It says, when the woman saw, when the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. When the woman saw, she now believes an illusion. God had said, it's not good for food. It may be pleasant to the eyes. It is not good for food, and it is not a tree to be desired to make one wise. God warned that it will bring death. But now her eyes tell her something different than what she heard with her ears. Now, listen to me on this. Every one of you, listen to me. Men and women alike, listen. You and I were created by God to hear him. He reveals himself to us by his word. He reveals himself to us. Divine revelation involving written text, which can be read aloud and we can hear. And faith comes by hearing, not seeing, hearing, hearing the word of God. Adam and Eve, their obligation was to process everything that their eyes were telling them through what God had spoken to their ear. Her eyes open, this is what happens, it's not a good thing. It's not like uh, little babies and we keep waiting for their eyes to become functional. We talk about those little infants, now their eyes are open. Like, you know, like they've, they've uh, matured to this level, right? This is not, what the, this is not that, no, this is, this is moving in the wrong direction. Eyes are open, now they are 
subject to illusions. Easily deceived by appearances. What happens here? Oh, by the way, I, I, I mentioned to you that we are another reflection of the triunity of God, spirit, soul, and body. Note that on every level of her being, that sixth verse, verse six, tells us that it appealed to every level of her being. It was good for food. It, it appealed to her physically. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was aesthetic. It was beautiful. And it, appeared, it appealed to her um, emotionally. And it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. That was the illusion. And that appealed to her spiritually. She took action on what she believed. She will admit to being deceived. And indeed she was. She took of the fruit and ate it. She gave it to her, also to her husband with her and he did eat. Verse 7 says, And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Instantly they know they're naked. And naked... They were naked before and they were now ashamed. Now, raging shame at the very center of their bodies, parts of their bodies given to them to bring us all into existence. As if innately they knew they just sent us all to hell. As if they knew innately they just took us all down with them. They went down, they fell and they knew it. Some have proclaimed, I must agree with them, that the very beginning of works-based religion happened when they sewed fig leaves together and tried to cover themselves. They tried with their own efforts to do something about the problem, but it was inadequate, and they knew it was inadequate as soon as they hear the voice of the Lord God. The trees from which they took the leaves were not enough. And all the trees of Eden were not enough to cover them. Verse 8 says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I want you right now to take note of the wording that Moses has given to us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that they heard the voice of the Lord God walking. I don't know that they saw God. God dwells in light, unapproachable. I have no indication that they actually laid their eyes on God the Father. But rather, it is abundantly clear that he reveals himself to them by his words. That God reveals himself by the logos. God reveals himself by his voice. He does not appeal so much to our eye as to our ear. And if we hear correctly, then our eyes will actually confirm everything that he has told us. They hear the voice of the Lord God, and they hide. Verse 9 says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where art thou? This is a God who knows everything, asking a question. Not for him to learn anything, but for Adam to learn. God asks questions. God invites confession. He doesn't go immediately to where they're hiding and go, ha, you did it, didn't you, you little sinner? <laughs> no, instead, God called him by name, Adam, Adam, where are you? This is as if God would say, look at where you are. Look at what you're doing. Adam, where are you? Adam has to come out. There's no hiding from God. In verse 10, 
Adam, it says, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, Yahweh, the creator, he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Have you, Adam, in fact, joined the rebellion that's happening in this universe? Will you please take note that God asks him, is there something you want to tell me, son? Have you eaten? Just get it out. Just say it. Now, Adam's response is the truth. Some preach it different than, and they say Adam was just being a wimp and hiding behind the woman and saying, no, it was her. It was her. And actually, it was you because you made her and gave her to me. But that's not what I see here. Instead, I would draw your attention. Verse 12, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me, and I did eat. The words, I did eat, are true. The reason he did eat is because she gave it to him. If we had the time, I would take you to the New Testament teachings of the Apostle Paul in the pastoral epistles. And in the pastoral epistles, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2 states plainly by the Holy Spirit that the man, Adam, though guilty, was not deceived. But the woman being deceived, was in transgression. Now, the, the scripture indicts Adam as the problem. The scripture indicts Adam as the one who affected all of us. Adam is the one who put us in the mess we're in. By one man's actions, all of us were affected. You know what the truth is, too? You know what the truth is? The truth is, we were all there. We were in Adam. We're part of him. We're just reproductions. We are Adam. If the man was not deceived, you have to wonder, if he wasn't deceived, why did he eat that fruit? Why? And I believe the revelation to that mystery is right there in Adam's words. The woman you gave me she gave me. You'll see as we read on that God is going to say to Adam, because you've done this, because you hearkened unto the voice of your wife. Adam hearkened to the voice of his wife, but Adam was not deceived. What does that tell us? Why did he eat that fruit? He wasn't deceived, but he hearkened to the voice of his wife. Well, let me tell you something. She didn't give him a testimony. She didn't tell him this is the most wonderful thing. You've got to join me here. God can't be trusted. He's trying to keep us down. He's trying to prevent our evolution. She did not pass on the lie that she had acted on. As a matter of fact, I believe that's a pretty good indication that she knew it was a lie instantly. As soon as she took a bite, she knew she just died. She gave it to her husband. She gave it to him. He hearkened on the voice of his wife. What did she say to him? I said to you again, she didn't give him a philosophical argument. She didn't give him a testimony of how wonderful this, this fruit was or this knowledge of evil was. No. I'll tell you what happened. Dear ladies, I want you to know something. She, our mother Eve, became the mother of all insecurities and all the fears that every one of you have been plagued with your entire life. Every single lady in this room, every one of you, daughters of Eve, have lived with a fear that you would not be loved 
or the fear that the one who has promised it will withdraw it. Some of you have not only had to live with that gnawing fear, many of you have had to live it and experience it, that love was taken, love was promised, and you were betrayed, you were lied to. A weak man could not be true to you. And he's broken your heart. And then he's got the nerve to ask you to accept that and forgive him. And then does it again and again. And the cruelty of that whole arrangement all began right here. What did she say to him? What did she say that he hearkened unto? I'm telling you, she said, Adam, don't leave me. Don't leave me here. Adam, don't look at me like that. I'm the same girl. Don't, Adam, come on. Don't leave me. Please don't leave me. She begged and she pleaded. And that is the only explanation for his action. God turns his attention to her. And he said, the Lord God said to the woman, verse 13, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. The woman said, the serpent deceived me. I believed some lies. Those lies happened to be about God. What a shameful thing to have to admit to God. And I believed that you were not good. I believed that you were lying to us. And I took action on what I believed. She's, she's having to admit, I know it was a lie now. I know it was a lie. But she's admitting to God that she believed some trash about him. And she took action on that. Disgraceful, shameful. But I submit to you that Adam's confession is worse. Because Adam couldn't say, I, I was fooled. I was deceived. Adam couldn't say it. Adam has to confess something awful. Adam has confessed to God that he was torn between two loves and he chose her over God, the creator. He chose the created thing over the creator. He chose the gift over the giver of the gift. All the sadness of it, all the shame of it. He didn't have to do that. He could have cried out to God. You and I know enough about God now. Surely Adam knew enough to know that, that God might have a cure for this. And he could have called out, but he did not. He took action. He took matters into his own hands. He comes into the scene where she's holding that forbidden fruit and there's a piece missing. And he says, what have you done? And he tears it from her hand. And she pleads. And he looks at that fruit. And he looks at her and he looks at it again. He puts that fruit to his mouth and pulled the trigger and committed suicide. And he sent us all down to hell with him. He affected every one of us. And every single one of us are now the same way we're prone to choosing that which we can see over that which is invisible. We're prone to choosing Creation over the creator. Prone to it. Prone to idolatry. And that was Adam's sin. Idolatry. You understand the command, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Adam surely understood it as well. Though it may not have been spoken to him. Oh, listen, listen. Try to imagine the, the moment where God the Father is laying out to his son Adam. You see this tree. This beautiful tree. Now all these trees that are beautiful, all of these that are pleasant to the eyes and good for food, they're all yours, but son, that one. Don't eat that one. On the day that you do, you will surely die. Now in that impartation of a warning, don't you think you, if you were Adam and you were there, you would say, God, well, why does it have to be here? Let's, let's cut it down. Let's destroy it. If it's deadly, 
let's get it out of here, right? Wouldn't you? Haven't you also found yourselves asking the question, why was that tree in the midst of the garden? Haven't you found yourself asking, why? Is there a forbidden fruit, a, a forbidden tree in my life? Why? Haven't you found yourself asking, why? I believe Adam did. Mm -hmm. I have to believe that Adam also wondered. And I suspect that Adam asked, that Adam would have said, all right, it, it's that bad? Let me kill it. And God said, no. And Adam would say, well, why does it have to be there? And if Adam said that, I can tell you what the creator would have said to him because he said it through his son. Through the son of God, he said, if you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commandments. And at that moment, Adam would understand. All right, I get it, okay. So I can love you by not eating that. So that's the purpose. I can love you. I can demonstrate my love and my trust in you by not eating that. Men and women, let me point out something to you. You and I, uh, I'm sure you're aware of this, are sexual beings created with a capacity to become one. Created with a capacity for a union. And as a sexual being, I don't know if this is, I don't know if you know this or if you've ever stopped to consider it. Do you know how you will love God? And you know how you will love your spouse the most? As a sexual being, you will love God most by not having sex, by abstaining. You will love your spouse by not having sex with anybody but them. Now think about this for a second. It's a world full of people. You will primarily demonstrate your love for the person you've entered a covenant with by never having that union with anybody else. Do you understand what I'm, submitting, what I'm suggesting to you? Do you guys get this? That tree was an opportunity for Adam to demonstrate his allegiance to God, his trust in God, his love for God. But love went bad in Eden. And he loved someone more than God. And she, our mother Eve, mother of all beauties, she became an idol to him. And he engaged in worship. Do you understand that? Ah, brothers. Brothers, dear brothers, are you also aware that God knew that he would do this? And the plan to save us is older than creation itself. Before God made the world, before he made the world, before he made that man and that forbidden tree, he already had a plan. A plan to love us despite the fact that we have failed to love him perfectly. Do you understand that this whole arrangement grants God the opportunity to love us and to win us, to demonstrate how good he is by his grace and to capture our hearts? It's actually a beautiful love story. It really is. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? All right, I'm not going to talk much longer because I've lost you. You guys are all going to sleep. I, I know my voice is just so soothing. <laughs> it's been a long day. And you, like good soldiers, have endured. But i got to get you to this place where you understand what happened here in Eden. Did you understand 
that you and I have the freedom to choose. And all of our choices, just like Adam, that we have acted on, even the things that we didn't act on, reveal that we are sinners. The authority of our king, the creator of the universe, does not stop at the actions because the Son of God informed us that every one of us who have looked lustfully have already committed adultery. Every one of us that have coveted have already committed sin. Every one of us who have hated in our heart someone have murdered already in our heart. So his authority, his sovereignty, his reign extends all the way even to there. We are sinners. I can't leave you in this, uh, w- with this mess. We've got to go just a few verses further. Please note, God calls to Adam and says, Adam, what have you done? Is there something you want to tell me? And Adam answers God truthfully. The woman you gave me, she gave me, and I did eat. God turns to the woman and says, what is this that you've done? And she said, the serpent deceived me beguiled me and I did eat. God turns his attention to the serpent and he doesn't invite any confession. God doesn't say, now is there something you want to tell me, little fella? No, instead, God declares war. That's what God did. God declares war. God declares to the serpent. The first, the physical being, that That dragon that was the mouthpiece for the entity is cursed to be legless and crawling and licking the dust all of its days. That, in verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The first curse in verse 14 applies to the physical, the animal, the creature. Verse 15 is the very first promise of a savior. It is where Christ is specifically for the very first time referenced, the first mention. It's the very first prophecy in the whole Bible. The very first prophecy happened in Eden when God announced to Satan one day, one very unique man, He's going to crush your head. Now he will suffer in order to do that because you'll, you'll bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Do you understand? By referring to the Messiah as the seed of the woman, that's the very first hint. Now it's just a hint. I'll grant you that. But it's the very first hint that one day a man would be born without a human father. That one man, one very unique man, our hero, would be born of a virgin. You know, you remember when um, in Luke chapter um, 24, two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, Christ joined them. They didn't recognize him. They thought he didn't, him to be still dead. They didn't recognize him. Their eyes were prevented from recognizing him, and he he said, why are you guys so sad? What are you so bummed out about? And they said, well, what are you, a stranger that you don't know what's happened here in these, these days? And he said, oh, please tell me. Tell me all about it. And they talked about him to him. <laughs> they talked about him being awesome, doing all kinds of miracles. And we believed, we don't now, but we had believed that it was him that would save us. Now he's dead been three days, and I make it even weirder, now there's some women that were of our number, and they said they've seen him alive. (laughs) The Lord goes, 
well, you guys are kind of slow, ain't you? You guys are just a little dumb. Didn't you know that that was supposed to happen? Didn't you know that Christ was supposed to suffer and then enter into his glory? Wow, you guys. The greatest underdog story that has ever been told. The greatest hero that has ever been gave himself every handicap imaginable. He, and he's the creator himself, and he entered into this realm as a man to take on an enemy that is greater than humanity. Remember, God made a man a little lower than the angels. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters. <laughs> the suggestion from God... The announcement that one day a man's going to crush your head must have sounded ridiculous to the devil, to the actual serpent. Men, you understand something about the fight business, right? The, the fight game, combat sports. I'm not endorsing them necessarily. Well, maybe. But you understand then in the... The fight game, you have weight classes, right? We have weight classes. You don't want little bitty guys fighting big giant guys. You want big guys to have big enemies, big opponents, right? You have weight classes. But isn't it glorious when a smaller man <laughs> fights outside of his weight class and beats the giant? That's a, those are beautiful stories, and they happen. They do indeed happen where wisdom is greater than strength, you know? <laughs> when when a, a little guy like David goes up with a sling <laughs> to confront a giant, a mutant, David was not just fighting outside of his weight class. He was outside of his life form class. That thing wasn't even human. It was a mutant. Nine feet tall. And he wants to, he wants to go hand to hand with, with David. <laughs> he's, he's going, get over here. I'm going to pull you apart. He, he doesn't even draw his own sword out. <laughs> the giant. The giant is instantly offended that someone that small steps up. Takes it real personal. He's instantly offended. You, you've read it in 1 Samuel, and the giant's going, what? Is this? And this is after 40 days of issuing the challenge, strutting back and forth in the Valley of Elah. And nobody comes until one day they send a kid out with a stick. A kid with a stick. That's what you would send out to deal with a bad dog. And that's exactly how Goliath took it. Goliath was outraged, offended. Is that a, is that a kid? Is that a kid? Are you kidding me? A kid. Is that a stick the kid has? And he like loses his mind over the fact that it's a kid and a stick and he is personally insulted. And he just starts yelling at the kid, get over here, just get over here. I'm going to pull you apart. I'm going to feed you to the scavenger birds. <laughs> and the kid, the kid was cool. And the kid goes, <laughs> okay, well, you come against me with a sword and a spear. <laughs> he doesn't go, I come against you with a sling and a rock. No, he goes, I come against you. In the name of the God of Israel, whom you have defied, prepare to die. And I'm going to feed you to the birds. 
<laughs> the giant goes, ah, like loses. I can, I can imagine. He pulled his helmet off. Throw it down. Get over here. And he starts running. And no sword, no spear, which David had mentioned. He leaves the sword in the scabbard. <laughs> and David runs toward him because there's a, a distance that's just ideal. You don't want to get too close. <laughs> or he's going to grab you. See, the giant wants to wrestle. David determines to shoot him. And he does. Oh, the, and the composure, the composure that that took, the, just, the, the cool nerves to just keep your cool, close the distance, and, and fire. Boom! <laughs> Drops the mutant. Runs over quick before that mutant can get back up. Stands on the mutant. And oh, there's a sword that's not doing anything. <laughs> Monstrous sword. And there's a giant, a mutant, helpless to do anything about it. And his head comes off. And David picks up that mutant's head. And it's got a really surprised look on its face. Blood's draining out of the bottom of it. This is a beautiful picture. <laughs> and he carries that trophy. I don't even know how high he could lift it. And if you lift it up too high, you're going to get blood all over you. I love that story. Don't you, don't you love that story? I'm telling you something. That's, that's not the greatest story. The greatest story of being outside your weight class, outside your life form class, is the man born of a virgin who indeed would have his heel wounded. Our king, our hero, spiked onto the cross is only a bruised heel in contrast, in comparison to what he did to his enemy's head. That seems like a nice place to leave this. And we'll pick up with it tomorrow. Do you understand? Do you understand the glory of the king that is revealed from one end of this book to the other? The glory of this king who comes down as a man. Even identity, he doesn't, he, he, an ultimate showdown will happen in the Judean wilderness, in the desert. Satan becomes aware, along with Herod the king, that this promised one from Eden has been born. But Satan doesn't know where. Satan has his limitations, you see. He's not God's opposite. He's not God's evil equal. God has no equal. And Satan seeks to find out where was this kid born. Through Herod, he tries to find out he fails. That kid disappears off his radar and lives as a child. The creator himself, the one who made the world, has to learn how to walk on it as an infant. The creator who spoke everything into existence has to learn to speak and then learn his own word and his own identity. He immersed himself into our weakness and our ignorance in the incarnation. As a baby. 30 years, no mention to Satan about that kid. Where'd that kid go? What happened to that kid? I can only imagine Satan talking to all the principalities and powers about that kid. You find that kid. <laughs> they must have assumed, they must have assumed that, that when he murdered all the babies in Bethlehem, he got them. Until one day, God rips the sky open. At the baptism of our Lord, the sky is ripped open and God goes, this, God 
the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Talk about the triunity of God. It is, it is all three distinct, separate persons of the Godhead present right there. God, the Father speaking from heaven, the Spirit seen descending and resting dove-like upon the Son. The Spirit leads the Son out into the desert to meet this enemy from Eden. <laughs> And he meets him in such humility, such a humble way. He meets him as a man. He doesn't let the glory out like he did up on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember? Up on the Mount, when he let it out, and it was like, it was blinding light brighter than the sun. The miracle of the Transfiguration wasn't that he let all that glory out. No, it was that he could pack it back in and keep it veiled and just be one of us. A face in the crowd, a regular guy. At least that's what it looked like. Please stand with me. Come on, everybody stand up. Band. Worship leaders. It is only right that we should tonight leave here singing our praise of him once more. At least one more, if not more. Tomorrow, I'm asking you to return. And let's pick up right where we left off. Because there are things that you need to actually know. There are things that are relevant to right here today. I told you, I'm going to make the case to you that women have it worse. No, I'm not saying, and I'll be clear now, God is not punishing womankind for what Eve did. But I'm telling you, dear ladies, I will give you the explanation why you suffer so much, why you hurt so much. Why? In this sin-cursed world, is it worse for you than it is for the men? But I also spend, I plan to spend time talking to you about the hero who is there for you and coming to your rescue of your broken heart. The one who will love you, ladies, the one who will love you like no man, mere man on earth could ever love you. The God man. Father, I pray for every man and woman here tonight and I ask that you please help us to, I don't know, grow in our understanding and consequently grow in our absolute wonder of your greatness. I pray, Lord, that you'd open our eyes to realize you are so much more than we ever knew, that you are so worthy of our lives, our love, and our praise. And we offer ourselves up to you now as we end the day together. Amen.